sounds good. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, NSTORY is very excited to have Jane West with us presenting on the teacher preparation regulations that are coming up in January, so it's sort of a timely matter. Um, she has a full presentation for us tonight. If you would like to add any comments or ask questions in your toolbar as part of your Zoom icon, there's a chat box icon. Uh, feel free to type anything in there during the presentation, and we'll have time to address that at the end. All right, take it away, Jane. OK, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for taking some time during this incredibly busy holiday season to be, be with me and to think about these really significant uh, regulations that have been proposed by the Department of Education. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in, and I'm going to run through these slides. It's, uh, it's a lot. It's complex. It's a lot to take in and digest. So hang in there with me, and then when we get to the end, we will have plenty of time for comments, discussion, and questions. So let's start with the first slide. Just a little background. Um, this is a proposed regulation. Sarah, can you move us to the first slide? OK. This is a proposed regulation, and um, as such, there is a comment period. Uh, it's a 60-day comment period. It's unfortunate that it comes right smack in the middle of the holiday season, but it does. Uh, the, the comments on the entire regulatory package are due February 2nd, uh, and the Department of Education says repeatedly in the documents that they published in the Federal Register that they want to hear from the field. So this is really important. Uh, that you provide your comments. This is how they know whether or not what they have proposed uh, is a good idea, it, what the field thinks about how it might be implemented, etc. There is a link here to the proposed regulations. They were in the Federal Register on December 3rd, and that link will take you to them. Um, they are 75 pages long three columns of intense um, small print. <laughs> so let me just say that the first portion of that 75 pages is a description of what's in there, and that's over a third. The second portion is a burden and cost analysis, uh, which is very important. They get into great detail with their burden estimates down to the half an hour level in some cases, and they really do want feedback on those estimates as well. The final third of that proposal is the actual regulations, but I really do urge you to take a look at the whole thing. So with the next slide, we'll look at a little more background. This regulatory proposal um, has been around for a while. It, there was a negotiated rulemaking panel in 2011-2012, which failed to reach consensus on this proposal. And so it was disbanded, and the department, the ball goes back into the court of the department, and they are free to publish uh, whatever they see fit, and that is what they have now done. Um, these are new regulations on Title II of the Higher Education Act, which has never had regulations before. Title II is the part of the Higher Education Act that covers teacher preparation, uh, particularly a whole lot of data collection that's required in there. Um, the other part uh, of the Higher Education Act that this regulation covers is in Title IV, which is the Federal Student Aid Title, and the TEACH grants are in there. TEACH grants are a form of federal student aid, and what this proposal does for the first time is that it links Title II to Title IV to the TEACH grants. What it is saying is uh, this regulation is defining a high-quality teacher preparation program which is the only sort of program that a person utilizing a TEACH grant can participate in. So the whole idea here is to link these two, what up until now have been 
separate provisions and separate programs. Next slide. Just some basic facts here to give you a sense of the magnitude and the reach of this. There are a total of 25,000 individual teacher preparation programs around the country. This regulation proposes to rate each of the 25,000 individual programs. So a program is really defined as one that leads to certification in a particular area. So uh, a, college of a college or university, you'll see in the last point there, offers approximately 15 unique programs um, within their college. That's the average. Some offer as many as 33 or 34. Some offer as few as one or two. Um, so these are just some more sort of some more background on the uh, spread, the, the breadth and depth of these regulations. The next slide. So this slide right here is probably the most important one. I've tried to capture here the basic scheme that's being presented in this proposal. What it says is that every state, every year, must rate every teacher preparation program on a one to four scale. So all 25,000 of those programs need to receive a rating one to four every year. Only the programs that get the top two ratings will be eligible to enroll students with TEACH grants. Uh, TEACH grants are a form of scholarships for prospective teachers. I'll explain a little bit more about that a little later. So how does a state determine uh, what the rating is. Well, the regulation proposes that there are four ingredients in this determination that every state must utilize. The first is student learning outcomes or teacher evaluations, if those evaluations include student growth as a significant, um, as a significant component. Sarah, I've got the chat room up. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, my screen was blocked there for a minute. Okay, so student learning outcomes is number one. Number two is employment and retention with a focus on high-need schools. You'll see I've got some asterisks there. That is because student learning outcomes must be satisfactory in order order for a program to be rated in one of the top two categories. So that is, that has a different weighting, um, uh, heavier weighting than the rest of the components. Employment and retention uh, with a focus on high-need schools. The employment and retention rate for new teachers in high-need schools is calculated separately and it must play a significant part in determining the employment portion of this rating. The third component of the rating system is survey results of graduates and employers. The fourth and final component is professional accreditation or program approval with certain components. So this is the overall scheme. Now, a lot of these slides that are going to follow here, we're going to go into detail about how they define a student learning outcome, employment and retention, et cetera, and then how they put all together this all together. I will note that there are over 20 new definitions in this proposal of things like what is a new teacher. Um, they are very uh, detailed and um, very important in terms of how all of this will be calculated. Okay, next slide. So the four performance levels are labeled as low performing, at risk, effective, and exceptional. And they must be based on those four factors, including in significant part employment outcome for high need schools and student learning outcomes. Next slide. So this is the first of those ingredients is student learning outcomes. Uh, they define student learning outcomes is defined there as data for teacher prep pro, teacher prep program in a state on the aggregate learning outcomes of students taught by new teachers are calculated by using either student growth or teacher evaluation measures. Next slide. So student growth is the first way that you could get a metric for student learning outcomes. Student growth is the change in student achievement in tested grades and subjects under 
ESEA and the change in student achievement in non-tested grades and subjects between two points in time. Now this could be value-added scores or it could be the student achievement in tested grades and subjects where the ESEA uh, requires that to occur. Next slide. So you'll also have the definition of student achievement in non-tested grades and subjects. If you are in a state that has a waiver, you, you will recognize this as the same uh, definition that is in the waiver. Um, this is determined by measures of student learning and performance, such as student results on pretests and end-of-course tests, objective performance-based assessments, uh, etc. Again, if you're in a waiver state, this will be familiar. If you are in a state that does not have a waiver, like California or Washington or North Dakota or Montana, you would now be required to do this. So this has been raised as a concern by a number of people that a requirement under the ESEA waivers would now be sort of airlifted into non-waiver states through a higher education regulation. So that is a very significant and far-reaching provision being proposed here. Okay, next one. So you remember that there were two ways you could measure student learning outcomes. Um, the first was student growth, and the second one here is the teacher evaluation measure. This definition will also be very um, familiar. Uh, it's based on the definition, again, in the waivers and in Race to the Top. The percentage of new teachers by grade span and subject level rated at each performance level under the local evaluation system consistent with statewide parameters that differentiates teachers on an annual basis using at least three performance levels and multiple valid measures determining the performance levels. Uh, there also is a definition of multiple valid measures, must include observations based on rigorous teacher performance standards and other measures of professional practice. Um, okay, so now I, let's go on to the next slide and we're going to leave that first ingredient of student outcomes and move to the second ingredient which is employment outcomes. So there are two, compl uh, two components of employment outcomes, placement and retention. The regulation wants to know where do the new teachers go to teach and how long do they stay there? Placement is only for the new, new teachers and graduates who've been hired in full-time teaching positions for the grade level span and subject area in which the teachers were prepared. Okay? Um, this does not have to include graduates who go to other states, private schools, positions that don't require certification, or those who have enrolled in graduate schools or joined the military. So, as you know, um, really no state has the data capacity to follow a student through data related to value-added type measures from one state to another. So this proposal is acknowledging that and not requiring uh, that those students be included. One of the concerns that's been raised around this is that there are some programs uh, that prepare a vast majority of students who go to other states. Uh, the state of Delaware is an exporter, exports about 75% of their new graduates. So their evaluation would be based on the proportion of teachers who did not leave the state. And if that is a very small proportion, uh, that, that can raise concerns. Okay, next slide. Okay, teacher retention rate. Um, this, the, there, there are three options outlined as to how a state could determine the retention rate. All of them uh, will involve following teachers for five years to determine that they have served for at least three consecutive years out of the five um, subsequent to their granted certification that allows them to teach. So these are three different ways to go about measuring that. Um, but that is the requirement for measuring retention. The next slide looks at both placement and retention in high-need schools. 
The regulation would require that these be calculated separately, so there would be one calculation for placement and retention for all new teachers from the program, and a separate calculation for uh, new teachers who have gone into high-need schools. Below there, you'll see three options for determining the definition of a high-need school, and the state can pick the one that they want to use. Uh, one of the concerns that has been raised around this is the question of uh, incentivizing the placement of new teachers in high-need schools. In other words, this system would envision giving um, extra weight to programs that place more students uh, or more new teachers in high-need schools. Um, the Elementary and Secondary Act, El Education Act, has a provision that um, uh, prohibits district, districts from disproportionately aggregating inexperienced teachers in high-need schools. So there seems to be a, a bit of a disconnect here uh, between those two, those two policies. So that, that is one concern that has been raised. So let's move on. And so different employment metrics for alternate routes. Uh, the regulation does indicate that states may choose to treat alternate routes differently from traditional routes in terms of the employment uh, outcomes. Um, there, because there are differences in programs that could affect employment outcomes, for example, most alternate route programs uh, require the individual to be serving as the teacher of record while they are simultaneously pursuing their preparation. So um, the question becomes, when are they actually a new teacher? And uh, the regulation uh, anticipates a, a couple, a few examples it provides of how states might choose to look at them differently. The first is applying the same standard differently, uh, and the second is weighting employment outcomes differently. Um, for example, if you've got to follow teachers for five years to determine how many stay three out of the five years, you might, a state might decide that for alternate routes, if 30% um, uh, stay at least three years, that would be sufficient. However, for traditional programs, they would look to see at least 80% stay. I, I am making up that example, but that would be uh, a decision that a state would make about different uh, applying these um, standards differently. Another would be to weight the uh, employment outcomes differently. In other words, for the alternate routes, the employment outcomes might be rated one way, and for the traditional programs, another way in terms of those four variables in the rating system. The regulation does say that these differences must result in equivalent levels of accountability and reporting. Where I have quotes through these slides, this is language directly taken from um, the department's publication in the Federal Register, the, the proposal. Okay, next slide. Um, the fourth ingredient, actually this is the third ingredient. I think I got my numbers wrong here, didn't I? Yeah, I sure did. Gee, sorry about that. I'll have to fix the slides. So pretend like that four says three. This is the third ingredient, survey outcomes. Uh, every state would be required to survey every new teacher and their employer um, every year to determine the, whether, the perceptions of whether or not the new teachers possess the skills needed to succeed in the classroom. Um, the regulation does anticipate that these surveys and also some of the employment uh, metrics may be developed in conjunction with CAPE, which is the professional accrediting entity for teacher preparation. Uh, this is, um, will be very new to most states. Um, I don't know if any of you all are in states where um, new teachers are surveyed about their programs or where employers fill out surveys. I know that some 
preparation programs, follow their graduates and do that. I believe the state of Arizona does this for their public institutions. I'm not aware of a state that does this for all new teachers from every program every year. So for folks who are teachers, this is something to think about too, is that you would be asked to, um, or, or if you're supervising new teachers, if you're in a role where you're doing that, you would be asked to fill out this survey uh, for, for any new teachers that you supervise. Okay, and the next slide, this is not ingredient number five, it's ingredient number four. Uh, the final ingredient for this rating system is a determination as to whether or not the program is approved by CAPE, the professional accreditation accrediting entity uh, that is actually is still a combination of NCAPE and TIAC, and CAPE is in the, in the process of merging, um, but that is the one professional entity that accredits teacher preparation programs. So the institution could choose to be CAPE accredited or approved by the state. If the state approves the program, the federal government would now require that it look at these um, components of the program. Does the program produce teacher candidates with content and pedagogical knowledge? Does the program provide quality clinical preparation? And there is a very specific definition of quality clinical preparation in the proposal that I encourage you to look at. Uh, does the program have rigorous entry and exit uh, requirements? And that is also uh, outlined in greater detail in the, in the proposal. States may choose additional measures uh, beyond these, and they must be equally applied to alternate routes and traditional programs. So those are the four ingredients, and now let's move on and look a little bit deeper at how this would all work. Um, states would be required to consult with stakeholders uh, periodically. There is a list of people who would need to be represented in the stakeholder consultation. Included in there are elementary and secondary school leaders and instructional staff. Uh, students, uh, faculty of teacher prep programs, advocacy organizations, etc. So what does this, what is the purpose of this consultation? Well, it's outlined very specifically in the proposal. First, uh, it is to consult about procedures for assessing and reporting the performance of each teacher preparation program. Secondly, it's to determine the weighting of the indicators. Remember those four ingredients uh, the state will determine which one counts how much and in consultation with these stakeholders. Thirdly, they would determine the method of aggregation of programs. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. That speaks to how big does a program have to be to be included in this rating system. The next one is state level rewards or consequences for performance levels. The regulation does require states to give rewards to programs that are performing high and consequences for programs that are performing at a low level. Finally, there would be created an opportunity for programs to appeal their rating. If they feel that it's not appropriate or correct, there would be an appeals procedure. Next slide. So that question of, of aggregation of data. Um, so every state must report on every program that produces 25 or more new teachers per year. The state is free to create a threshold that's lower than that, but in an effort to try to capture as many programs as possible, the, the, the department has proposed that states try to reach that threshold by either aggregating programs operated by the same entity or aggregating graduates over multiple years or a combination of the two. So if you have an undergraduate special education program that leads to new certification and a master's degree special education program that leads to new certification and neither of them prepares at least 25 new teachers a year, you may want to aggregate them so that you might get up to that level of 25 new teachers per year. Likewise, you could aggregate 
um, the new teachers over a period of years. But the regulation does foresee um, the state making efforts to be inclusive of uh, as many small programs as possible. Okay, next one. Low performing and at risk programs. So these are the two indicate these are the two low um, levels in the rating system, the two lowest levels the state are required to identify their low performing and at risk programs. This is in current law in the Higher Education Act. It's been there for some time. States have been doing it for some time. But now they must use those four ingredients to determine uh, which ones are low performing and which ones are at risk. And in significant part, student learning outcomes must be included. Next, next slide. Uh, if a program is identified as low performing, the state uh, must provide technical assistance and it may include some of the following things listed there. There's a, a series of examples of what the state uh, might do. Next slide. So what are the consequences for low performers? First is loss of state program approval. Second, loss of access to all student federal financial aid. This is current law. If a program is not approved in the state, if it loses its approval, uh, that pretty much means it's being closed down. The state no longer authorizes it to exist. So that is pretty much what is in place now. Um, this regulation would require that students who are in programs who become low performers receive these transitional services and they're outlined uh, in, the, in the proposed regulation. The regulation estimates that approximately 50 programs would lose their state approval because of low performance using these new metrics. Next slide. So um, let's talk about the TEACH grants now. Shift gear a little bit and now we're going to sort of jump from this rating system. How is this related to access to these scholarships for new teachers? TEACH grants are scholarships for teacher candidates of up to $4,000 a year for undergraduates, $4,000 a year for two years for graduate students. These grants are for high-performing students. You must have a 3.5, excuse me, 3.25 GPA or be in the top 25% of a standardized admissions test to college. Uh, you are required to, to serve in a high-need school, in a high-need field for four out of the eight subsequent years after you complete your preparation program. If that service obligation is not met, the scholarship becomes a loan and the student must pay it back the way you would pay back any student loan. This program has been on the books for uh, maybe about eight years or so. Uh, it is being utilized quite a bit, particularly in special education. Students, uh, which is a high need field, and students are, are using this scholarship to become special educators. Next slide. So the scope of this program, it's a $100 million program, which is not in the land of student financial aid, which is about it's billions and billions of dollars. This is a very small program. Uh, about half of the teacher prep programs uh, do use these grants. However, fewer than 100 institutions in, enroll the majority of the participants. It is estimated that with this new proposal, 3 to 8 percent of programs will lose their eligibility to enroll TEACH grant students. Next slide. So what is now a TEACH grant eligible program? So in order to be a program that can enroll students using this form of federal student financial aid, the program must be rated as effective or exceptional for two out of three years. So those are the top two ratings in that four-tier rating system. So right now, any program that in higher education that is approved in the state to operate can become TEACH grant eligible. Now, uh, this regulation would say you can only become TEACH grant eligible if you are rated in one of the top two categories. So the second set of TEACH grant eligible programs 
is STEM programs. These are programs, you may be familiar with them, where students major in a, in a school of liberal arts, in a physical or life sciences, technology, engineering, math, and then they go on and to take the courses they need to complete their, to, to be able to get a certification or a teaching credential. So these are not in schools of education. Now they have a different threshold to reach in order to become Teach Grant eligible. And I'm going to read this language, which is right from the proposal, even though I should have quotes around that, but it's it's written in a in a bit of an awkward fashion. But this is this is what it says. Um, Teach Grant eligible STEM program over the most recent three years for which data are available have not been identified by the Secretary as having fewer than 60% of its TEACH recipients complete at least one year of teaching that fulfills the service obligation within three years of program completion. So note that these programs that are housed in generally the School of Liberal Arts are not part of that one to four rating system. So they are not rated. So that is why they are in this separate, separate category with this separate definition for eligibility. And every year the secretary would publish a list of teach grant eligible STEM programs. Next slide. Okay, we're, get, we're getting to the end here. Bear with me. Uh, so here is the timeline. I, I won't go over it in depth, but just note that it's a long timeline. Um, the, this would begin, they anticipate issuing a final regulation uh, sometime in the middle of next year, 2015, and then states would be required to begin piloting these data systems and setting them up. And note that it is not until 2020-2021 whereby the TEACH uh, eligibility or ineligibility would become uh, would be implemented. In other words, that would be the first time a program might lose its TEACH eligibility because it was not rated high enough. Next slide. So what about the economic impact of this? The Office of Management and Budget has indicated that this is what's called a significant regulatory action, which means that it may have an annual effect on the economy of $100 million or more or adversely affect a sector of the economy, productivity, competition, jobs, et cetera. Um, when this is the case, um, a determination has to be made by OMB that the benefits justify the costs and that alternatives that have been considered have been rejected because the one they put forward here maximizes <coughs> the benefits. There is more discussion of that in the... Um, uh, in the proposal, and um, yeah, we'll come back to that in a minute. Next slide. So the Department of Education has, or the OMB, I, I actually it's the department, has determined that um, this will cost about $42 million to implement over a 10-year period, that this is the total cost of the regulations. Um, they have listed in the proposal what they see as the benefits of the regulation, uh, helping prospective students choose programs, helping employers uh, when they're recruiting and hiring, helping states make funding decisions, and helping teacher prep programs improve. And in the document, they do say they believe that the current Title II data collection has created a market failure due to imperfect information. So I guess this will produce perfect information, so we'll have a perfect market. I guess that's what we're after. Um, this cost estimate is, um, has raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, there is no money that will come with this regulation. States and institutions and uh, all of those responsible for data collection will have to find the money elsewhere uh, to, to implement this. Okay, next slide. According to the department, um, uh, there will be no additional data collected as a result of this in terms of institutions of higher education. Um, all the current data will continue to be collected, so what, what 
unfolds here is on top of what's already in place. Um, the department says that it will take four hours per institution to adjust from aggregating to disaggregating the program data. Right now, most of the data put forward by uh, Colleges of Education is aggregated. Now it has to be disaggregated by program. The annual total cost for all institutions of higher ed to meet the requirements of data collection is estimated to be 3.7 million annually. That's for all institutions of higher education. Again, these are the department's uh, calculations. Next slide. Overall burden. The Department of Education says the total aggregate burden uh, for this uh, new provision 612. 612 is the section with the rating system in it. Uh, is an increase of 507,000 hours for 1.3 million hours nationwide to implement that section. The American Institutes of Research uh, estimated in a blog that this proposal would, would require two to three full-time state employees for the first two years. In, in their justification, the department says that it has already invested significant funds in Race to the Top and through the state data longitudinal systems. Um, and um, they believe that many states already have a lot of this capacity in place. Um, I think that there are others who hold different opinions that you know, states really vary in, in their capacity to, to uh, pick up something like this. OK, um, next slide. So comments on data collection. Now, this is a separate deadline. I don't know if you all would want to uh, comment on this or not, but if there are folks here who are at institutions of higher education involved in this data collection, or if you think you might be a person who would in be involved in filling out that survey, um, I, I urge you to take a look at this. This is a separate request from the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, and they are interested in knowing specifically if their estimates about the number of hours these various components would take to implement and the cost uh, is accurate. So uh, if you are in a position to provide some feedback on that, uh, I think it would be very important to do so. Uh, go to the next slide, and it shows you how to do that. Uh, this is just taken verbatim out of the, the um, Federal Register, and there are the links there of how you send in your, uh, your information. But again, I urge you to go directly to, to, the, to the Federal Register and, and read more, more about it. Uh, and go on to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is submitting comments by February 2nd. These, this is the deadline for the comments are due, that are due in relation to the total proposal uh, on the proposed regulations. They are due February 2nd. It tells you there how to go about doing that. Um, I, I really urge everyone to submit uh, comments. I think that this, this regulation is, is very significant and very far-reaching, um, and it's really important that um, that you share your view as expert educators and as people representing the field. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very important thing to weigh in on. Okay, next slide. Okay, now we get to the, to the conversation, to the fun part here where I get to have some dialogue with you. These are just a few sort of general kind of things to reflect upon. Um, would these regulations result? in stronger teacher preparation programs. Um, there have been a number of people who have raised a challenge about these regulations. You know, where is the research to show that these four variables are actually indicators of program effectiveness, um, particularly employment and retention rate. We know that there are many reasons why people take jobs, why people leave jobs, why people stay. Uh, some of those are personal decisions. Some of them have to do with the working conditions in the school, et cetera. Um, so that, that's a question to consider. 
Uh, will these regulations result in stronger teacher preparation programs? Secondly, uh, how would they impact the teaching profession and the professionalization of teaching? Uh, enrollment in teacher preparation programs is way down, somewhere as much as 20 to 25 percent. Um, there is a shortage of teachers um, in certain fields, in certain areas. There's going to be a lot of retirements. Um, uh, the teaching field has been under assault. I certainly don't have to tell this audience that for, for a while. And what would the impact of this be? Uh, what might the unintended consequences of something like this be? Um, if you, as you think about where you are situated at a school, at a uh, local education agency, at an institution, in a state, um, can the costs and the work requirements of this be absorbed? Can this be done? Um, how would this new proposal interact with current state institutional decision making and authority? Because it, it definitely shifts the balance between the federal and state roles in terms of authority around teacher preparation. Um, and finally, the surveys. Um, what do you think the response rate would be for these surveys? Um, what about a principal getting, you know, a number of surveys about their new teachers year after year? What would the cost be? Um, what, would it, what sorts of questions would it take uh, to get information that is useful. Okay, and the final slide, next steps. Um, read the proposal carefully, share, share broadly with your colleagues, your networks, constituents, stakeholders, discuss the potential impact. Uh, I've read through these things. This is the fifth webinar, believe it or not, I have done on these things, and I think I've had a total of almost a thousand people on these various webinars, and Every time I do it or talk to someone, I have a new question and a new thought about this. So it's, there's a lot here for sure. Uh, be in touch with the organizations you affiliate with. Um, I can tell you they're all looking at this, thinking about it, reviewing it, talking about it. Uh, confer with your local state stakeholders, your legislators, your governors. The, I know the National Council of State Legislators is aware of this, the National Governors Association. Uh, what are the implications there for states uh, and state funding decisions, et cetera? And submit your comments. Uh, remember that first dead deadline is just around the corner. That is for uh, feedback on the burden and cost of these. And the February 2nd deadline is for your thoughts and your feedback on the entire proposal. So let me leave it there and see if we have any comments or questions uh, to go to. Sarah, I'll give it back to you. All right. If, if you'd like to type in your comments to the chat box or questions, um, I'll go ahead and read them out, or you can read them. Um, go ahead. Jane, this is Catherine Bassett. If an organization wanted to participate in providing feedback, what would be the best way for them to go about it? Um, collecting it first from their members and submitting one document, or would it have more impact for individual members to each submit their own comments? That, that's a great question, Catherine. I think the answer to that is both. Um, they really do pay attention to the volume of comments they get and they count them. So if every one of your members um, submitted a comment and you compiled it into one document, that would count as one comment. So I think what, um, what I encourage people to do is submit individual comments, okay. but also, also to submit a collective statement. Because I think that even though it doesn't count the, in, in volume, one, two, three, four, five, I think they will pay uh, particular attention um, when comments are submitted by organizations that represent an important constituency like Instoy. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Well, I can, I can raise another thought if while people are, are thinking of questions or digesting all of this, um, 
unless somebody else has already got, do we have more questions? Yeah, a question just came in from okay. Michael. It says, okay. how much resistance has been mounted by the IHEs for this legislation? Um, well, um, it's important to remember that this is a regulation. It's not legislation, and that, I know that sounds sort of like technical Washington talk, but this is something, and that, and that raises a, a good point, this is something that the Department of Education proposing is proposing. Uh, it is not something that the Congress has put forward or that the Congress is considering. However, uh, the Congress will be reauthorizing both the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the Higher Education Act next year. Senator Alexander, the new chair of the committee uh, in the Senate, has announced that there will be a bill introduced in January or in early February um, to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So Congress is sort of going along on one track, and the department is kind of going along on another track. Uh, much like you saw them move forward with the waivers. Um, so in terms of institutions of higher education, I think that they are now learning and digesting and beginning to understand what is in here. And I think that as they uh, dig, dig deeper and begin to understand more, um, they will have more concerns. So I think that there will be uh, a lot of questions raised. I think, too, it's really important for all of us. You know, it's kind of easy to throw rocks at uh, glass houses, I guess. I forget what the, what the expression is. But it's really important to put forward a positive vision, too. I think we all believe, certainly, that, you know, programs that prepare teachers should be accountable and should be, um, you know, responsible for what they do. Um, and the question is, you know, what, what is a valid and reliable way to do that? Um, and that, that really needs to be, um, to be explored. So I see another question here. What will happen if in two years there's a change in Washington? Can all this be reversed or abandoned? Um, well, that is the nature of politics, isn't it? Um, you know, you could ask the same question about the waivers. What happens with the ESEA waivers? Uh, when a new administration gets in in two years, will they continue them? Will they cancel them all? Will they, you know, what will they do? And so the answer is, you know, yes, a new administration comes in um, and they can alter them. Uh, they can abandon them. They can create new ones. Um, they certainly do have the prerogative to do that. It, it's not sort of I don't want to make it sound real easy because there are thousands and thousands of sets of regulations and paying attention to all of them uh, takes a lot of time, but that, that certainly is a possibility. Okay, shall I just read this next one? Yeah, that yeah. might be easier. Okay, the intent in the regulations is good. Increase accountability for teacher prep programs to provide evidence that they produce beginning teachers who are effective, stay, and impact kids. I hope we embrace the work that needs to happen. But we should consider opportunities to get, engage more stakeholders in the conversation and strategies for measurement. What is the attitude of most IHEs at this time? What is the greatest fear? Um, those are really good points, all of them. <clears throat> um, I think that institutions of higher education are concerned that they could be held responsible for things that are out of their control. Um, and my experience working with teacher prep programs is that they want to know how their graduates are doing. They want the feedback, um, and it's very hard for them to get it. Um, the data really aren't available, and when they are available, it's not really provided to them in a timely way that they can use it for program improval, uh, uh, improvement. I think the concern is that, that this information could be used in, in more of a sort of punishment fashion than an improvement fashion. And <clears throat> I hope that's not the case, but, um, you know, sometimes that happens. Um, there, the, the program, the, the, the state that probably has developed the most extensive data collection system around 
value-added measures tied back to preparation programs is Louisiana. And I can tell you the institutions of higher ed down there are, are very much involved in, they were involved in creating that system. They're involved in refining that system. Uh, they are involved in using that data to improve their programs. But that has taken 15 years, a tremendous amount of work. Um, and that is the only of the four ingredients there I put forward, only the student growth one is the only one they're looking at. They don't have the surveys, they don't have the employment outcome metrics, and they don't have high stakes consequences. Um, I think when high stakes consequences get involved, there's a whole new dimension of, of behavior that, that comes into play. Uh, can you speak about the reference to loss of state approval that the regs refer to? You had mentioned that this is not new and that it implies programs being closed down. Yet, am I wrong in thinking that this hasn't actually been enforced or happened to date? Very good question. Um, so, um, it is my understanding that preparation programs close um, not frequently, but they do close for many different reasons, often off the radar screen of the state. Uh, a program, you know, the word will get out, you know, people won't want to go there because it's not very good or, you know, and the, and the, and the institution will just close it, enrollment will dry up, etc. The reporting requirement, you know, to get on the state's radar screen before an institution might close a program itself, um, there would be indicators of low performance, such as low praxis scores. Um, and there have not been that many reported to the federal government, uh, though there have been some. And the data are in the thing, the uh, document that the department uh, issued. Um, you know, the other thing to think about, though, too, is, you know, closing programs, that is, there are a lot of local politics that go on there. I, I don't know if you've ever been involved in, in, you know, trying to close something where a lot of local people are employed and, you know, it may not be of highest caliber, but the local political dynamics are very much at play. And I think that um, one of the things that is could be useful would be the federal for the federal government to try to provide some sort of political cover uh, in situations where that needs to needs to happen. Um, but uh, that that is a that is a really a good question and one that I think um, you know bears bears greater consideration. So let's see, what's the next one here? Could INSTOI possibly host a teacher leader and IHE symposium to generate innovative ways to collect data and develop ideas that would meet regulations, a group that reflects various stakeholders that model having the initial conversation? What an interesting idea. Um, I have to um, turn that over to uh, Catherine. <laughs> Uh, that would be something that we would need to investigate next year when we have our, our budget figured out. Okay. We do one conference a year right now, and that's what our budget can manage. So okay. So it's something that we would have to seek funding for. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And it's a, a whole different ballgame. We would certainly be interested in working with IHGs to do some research around this issue jointly that we could jointly fund. Boy, I think but a conference is a whole different event. Yeah. I think that's a really great idea. I, you know, as I said, my, my experience is that programs want this information. Um, but, you know, they want it to be accurate and useful, too. You know, the state of Florida, this is just another example. Um, the state of Florida has a, a pretty, I don't know if there's anybody on the phone from Florida, but if you can correct me here if I'm off base, but I think they have a, a pretty well-developed um, data collection system where they trace their um, graduates back to their programs. And 
at least two years ago, now maybe this is different now, but I know the University of Central Florida, for example, had a thousand new teachers they produce, a very big program. And by the time they got to, first they had to take out the teachers who went and taught out of state. Then they had to take out the teachers who were in non-tested grades and subjects because that's all their data system followed was the tested grades and subjects. Then they had to take out the teachers who were not placed in um, their area of credential, you know, who were, who were teaching out of field. Mm -hmm. um, and when they finally got down to the number of teachers they had left, it was about 10% of their graduates. So while the data system's in place, um, it, it was a tall order to really follow all of those graduates and get uh, some information about them. So I, I think one of the concerns I have is that the, the, the proposal seems to kind of have a sense that this data capacity is at a level of development sophistication that it may not be. Right. Uh, okay. Lots of good thoughts. Um, and at this point, we are just about out of time. So, Sarah, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you, Jane, for doing this for a fifth time. I know that was a, a lot of information, and you were very thorough on it. And hopefully this will provide everyone with some good information and be able to, to, be able to provide some comments. Thank you for this great discussion. Absolutely. My pleasure. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye-bye. Happy you. holidays.